Good morning, what it do? Hey, it is great to see everybody today. Welcome to the stream. We are working our way through the book of Matthew. Today is no exception. I apologize. I would say that I'm having a bad hair day and thus the beanie, uh, but that's not completely true. Just a little bit cold in here. I got the heat on and it hasn't quite heated up to the point where I'm comfortable. Um, typically, uh, I, you know, I wear the long sleeves and the wool vests and all that kind of stuff, uh, but not today, not today. We're just going to uh, jump right in with the stocking cap. We are reading through the book of Matthew with the goal of reading the bulk of the New Testament here during the year. Uh, we're just doing a chapter three times a week. Today is our Monday example. Now, if you are just joining us and uh, you're wondering what the entertainment section is, not the education section. The entertainment section is something that I'm absolutely stoked about. It is Captain America. And you may be thinking, oh, wow, I didn't know you could just show a, a Marvel film on here. Uh, that's because this is before that. This is the serial, the 1944 version. I have, uh, have to confess, I have seen this once before but it was years ago. I was just a kid, and at the time, I found it, uh, you know, antiquated and a bit boring. Uh, my understanding, however, is that it actually has some very mm, interesting themes and at the same time, um, some very early kind of CGI type stuff. We'll see if we can pick out any of that. I say CGI. It's going to be practical effects, isn't it? Uh, no matter how much I want to say it's beyond that, it's going to be practical effects. Either way, I can't wait to see what that looks like. Well, before we do that, however, we are going to do our Bible reading of the day. This is Matthew chapter 4. If you've been following along with us, Christ went through his baptism last week, and this week um, he is basically going to, well, prepare himself to enter into public ministry, bringing us around to his time in the desert. Fairly famous passage. You have probably heard this before, heard it spoken of before, uh, but let's go ahead and read what the word actually says. Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Then Jesus was led up to the spirit, by the spirit rather, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came to him and said, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it's written, one does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. The devil then took him to the holy city, placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, because it is written. He has commanded his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so they will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, notice, each time here, um, it's going to happen thrice, but the first two times already it's happened that uh, Satan throws out the word of God and said, it is written, right? And, and then, so you should do this thing. And Christ responds with, it is also written. Meaning, if anyone at any point in your life says you must live your life in this way and they hand you one individual single piece of scripture, never forget. You have to compare that to every other piece of scripture, all 66 books. So a single verse isn't to stand alone. There are a few things that are very, very, very clear, like the Ten Commandments are very clear, but you take any one of those commandments, begin to break it down, compare it to the rest of scripture, and you find that living those very simple things can be fairly complicated. And Christ does exactly the same thing here. He says, throw, them, throw yourself down, the word of God says you will not bash a foot upon the stone. And he said, yeah, but you're not to put the Lord your God to the test, right? Uh, between those two things, that means I shouldn't throw myself off this tower. Verse 8. Again, the devil, he took him up to a very high mountain. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. And he said, of all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus says to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left and waited uh, left him, and suddenly angels came, and they waited on him, Christ. Now, interestingly enough, you don't see the devil saying, hey, I'm going to give you all this stuff, and Christ saying, yeah, but it's not yours to give. He never says that. Meaning sometimes as believers, as Christians, people who are trying to follow the 66 books of the Bible, 
we see the world and go, man, things are falling apart. You know, I got, I thought this was your, your world. Take it back. Um, from the very beginning here, when Christ was first starting ministry, um, the, the, earth and all the kind of comings and goings have clearly been handed over. If Satan has the power to give Christ these nations to come and worship him, then that means he has the ability to do that, right? And Christ doesn't um, doesn't re refute this statement. So we as believers must realize that this is not our world, right? We are strangers in this land. So Anyway, the devil leaves, verse 11, and the angels came to minister to Christ, verse 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, right? We were with John last week. He withdrew to Galilee and he left Nazareth. And he made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun at Nephele, so that when, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might then be fulfilled. And here's that prophecy. Land of Zebulun, land, land of Nephele, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen this great light. And for those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw these two brothers. Here we go. This is where it starts to get interesting. Uh, his two brothers, Simon, who was called Pete, and Andrew, his brother, casting their nets into the sea because they were fishermen. And he said, follow me and I'll make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And he went from there. He saw two other brothers, the sons of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets. He called to them. Immediately they left their boats and their father, and they followed him. Now I'm going to pause for just a second. I know it's supposed to be Bible reading, not preaching time, but something that's very interesting here is all of these men have left their ability to make money, right? They left their profession. Christ says, follow. They drop everything and just go do. So often in my life, I see that God's calling me to do a thing, and I will spend hours, days, weeks, months arguing with the Holy Spirit saying, no, that's not the thing I had in mind for me. Here, these men, they see that God is moving and they just get on board. Um, I wish I could be a little more like that. Maybe you're in the same boat. Verse 23, Jesus went through Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, curing every type of disease, every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all of Syria. They brought him all the sick those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, um, epileptics, paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. One more point I want to make right here um, is that Christ did things for people, right? Uh, not just saying, uh, I'm going to preach and I'm going to teach the good news. He actually did stuff. Here we see healings happening. You know, we kind of fall in that same category with our local churches. If you're part of a local church, um, a certain amount of time does need to be spent teaching and preaching and encouraging the word of God, right? Worship, all of that, uh, all the fundamentals of the faith. Communion is one of those as well. But on top of that, we also must be serving people. And sometimes that's in practical ways, very practical things like feeding them, giving neighbors ride to the hospital or to the, the, the dental clinic when they can't drive afterward or whatnot. Oftentimes we think of that as that kind of service or helps industry. And we're like, man, that's not what the church is about. It's definitely what Christ was about, right? That's one way in which you can show the gospel, show the love of Jesus to people around you is by the way you treat them, things that you can do for them. And in this case, very physical needs are being met. And that's absolutely how Christ started his ministry as well. So if you have that kind of weird um, mix where you're not sure exactly which side of that fence you should fall on, I encourage you to be doing both the helps ministry and the pure teaching, preaching ministry that you're called to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer and we're going to jump right in and see what the 40s and Captain America have for us. God, thanks for some time and your word today. God, I know that uh, we don't always find the time to spend in private um, study, right? In, in time to really seek the word. 
So God, this week, I pray you give us the courage and the time and the wherewithal to set up a little bit of time to study you in our own private prayer closet, God. And we ask that we will be willing, like the sons of Zebedee, to drop everything and follow when you call. Help us to hear your voice when you're speaking to us. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.